Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The purpose of this demonstration is to illustrate the methods for checking amounting for occlusal adjustment and also to demonstrate the principles of occlusal adjustment. This articulator has two casts that have been mounted using a centric relation wax bite off of the mannequin that is in lab. The idea is to try to keep the plaster that is used to mount this confined to the area of the rings and the upper surfaces of the articulator. It does not have to be highly polished or extremely smooth, but it should be confined to those areas. The first thing that one checks in any mounting is where is the initial prematurity. Now, in order to do this on this articulator, we have the balls of the articulator locked completely forward in centric, occlusion, centric relation so that there is no movement anterior, posterior, or right to left, and that has been accomplished by tightening these set screws. Now by raising the pin, one closes the articulator until one feels the initial contact. Now using some suitable shim stock, such as this uh, shiny silver plastic, one can close the articulator until it makes contact and attempt to draw out the plastic. Now there's an area where the plastic does not draw. It draws there, does not draw there. We turn the case around, draws there, there, there. So it draws completely out of the left hand side and the right hand side in this area of the first molars and in the bicuspid region, cuspid area, there seems to be a contact. Now this paper is only five ten thousandths of an inch and that is extremely thin. Generally we may be working only with a tissue paper that's about one to one and a half thousandths of an inch thick, so that would be three times thicker than this. Now we have established that our contacts are in this area and in this area and we want to mark them on the cast. So we use this Madam Butterfly Red Typewriter ribbon to mark this. And we use this because this ribbon being a cloth conforms more exactly to the cast than does this stiffer uh, articulating paper. And the articulating paper has a tendency to scuff and mark the teeth, whereas the highly flexible cloth adapts much better. Now we tap this again to try to get a mark. Again, we tap here. We open the cast up. And looking at the upper, we have in this area of tooth number five, we have a prematurity that is marked. Now there are some extraneous marks already on this cast from when I was checking it before filming. This is the area of the prematurity that will be circled in here. Now as I said there is also one in the area of the molars. That is here. Now, maybe I'll tap it again and see if it marked better. Okay, and that's also here. Now on the lower cast, if we tilt it up into the, we can find that the bicuspid on the upper has a corresponding contact on the lower in this area, and the molar has a corresponding contact in this area. Now, in your possession, you have 
a chart that has the illustration of a in dental arch from second molar to second molar. And what one would do is take a pencil and outline the area on the occlusal surface of this drawing where we have the contacts. Now we had one on tooth number five in about this area and we should use a little bit darker marker. And then we had one in tooth number three, a little bit here, and then along here we had a contact. And on the lower we had a contact on 30 about here, and on, I believe it was 28, it was right about there. Now those are the areas of the prematurities, and on your card there's a special spot that says prematurities, and those are the areas that you should write down uh, the tooth number of your prematurity. Now this is check the centric relation prematurities. The other thing to check is to make sure that the centric occlusion that is in this mounting is the same or as close as possible to the centric occlusion of the mannequin. Now in centric occlusion we're supposed to have as many of the teeth making contact um, as in the mouth and generally it's accepted that all of the teeth, unless they're in anterior open bite situations or an unusual cross bite situation, should have one centric occlusion stop. Now what we do in that case is we release these screws. Now that frees up the articulator. We should always check it. Make sure your articulator moves very freely in all directions. And now we'll let it if they come in closer onto the front here, this is the initial contact right there, and that's the slide. There's the initial contact, and that's the slide. Now you see this slides over to toward the um, left-hand side. The contact is here, and it slides to the left. This is the centric relation. Prematurities are making the only contact now. This is an unstable position. That's why they're called prematurities. And this goes to the left-hand side. Now, we can also take a look at this slide by getting a little close-up of this table here and looking at the pin. This cast is now in its centric occlusion position and it's stable. And we drop this pin down and just to show you, this pin is now making contact with the table. This is centric occlusion. So this is a vertical dimension of centric occlusion. If we move to the centric relation position, that is bring the balls up against the stop, and now look at the table, we can see that the pin is now off the table about a little bit more than a millimeter. And we can watch the pin as it slides. The pin drops as the vertical dimension changes. So the vertical dimension and centric relation on these prematurities is actually about a millimeter greater than the vertical dimension and centric occlusion. Now, as I said, we were checking the centric occlusion contact. So we could do the same thing with this. Now this, again, this shim stock being extremely thin, will probably not catch uniformly in all areas because of some cast errors. But here we have a, this is again in centric occlusion we're checking. Remember that this side in centric relation had no contact. It catches, it's just barely catching there. I can draw it out if I pulled. It's, I can feel it drag there, a firm contact here, firm contact here come around again, firm contact there, firm contact there, contact there, contact there, and a little bit light on that particular area, but this cast mounting has a contact for all the teeth because we were able to catch the shim stock that was only five ten thousandths of an inch thick. So to summarize 
the methods that we've used to check this mounting, we have first determined that we do have prematurities. We have located them. We have checked the slide. The slide should be quite similar to the slide of the mannequin. And thirdly, we have noted that the centric occlusion contacts on the cast, when put together, are complete. Now, if we go to the back side of this, we have a way of checking when these casts are in error in the centric occlusion contact. Now, here's the centric relation position. You can see there is a space between those molar teeth. As it slides the centric occlusion, a contact is made. Now, in some mountings, in centric occlusion, there will be a space like this. Now, this is because the mounting is incorrect. And one can demonstrate that this mount is incorrect. So we'll, again, leave it the way it, the same, the tight shot. I'm going to make it so that this centric occlusion is now, we'll say that this is an incorrect mounting. Now there's a space there. And one could demonstrate that this is wrong by going back to the top of the articulator. We have a jack screw up here. If I loosen this jack screw, it frees the upper cast from the articulator. Now, if we go back to the tight shot, the upper cast can be put into a contact relationship. In the molar area. And as we tighten the screw up, you'll see the cast lift. See that? Uh, there is, that is with the jack screw released, the cast is free. You see I can wobble the cast without changing the articulator because it's free on the screw. If I tighten the screw up and this mounting is incorrect, there will be a separation as the screw is tightened. And what this means is that the mounting that has been recorded when the articulator is locked and the casts are against the upper and lower member is not the same as the articulation when the casts are held in your hand. If you looked at the casts while they were in your hand, you would see that they would have the tight contact in the posterior area, and they should also have that tight contact when they're mounted on the articulator. So now I'll correct the articulator so it's back in the way it was. Okay, so there's a centric slide, and there's our intimate contact. So this is a way that the instructors will demonstrate to you, illustrates how the mounting can be off in centric occlusion. The centric occlusion of your mounting should be the same as the centric occlusion in the patient or on the mannequin. And that would be the same centric occlusion that you get by holding the cast together. Now we'll move on to the actual adjustment. Now, with the chart that we had before, we marked, and we tried to be quite precise, the places where we had centric relation prematurities. And we had one there on number five, and we had an area on three, these two places, and then on 30, we had one here, so this drawing doesn't quite illustrate the three-dimensional effect, but you see this cusp being conical when it goes into this place, the outside face and the inside face, this being the buccal face of the cusp, this being the lingual face of the cusp. This contact here being brought about by this one. So at this first stage, your chart should have only the centric relation prematurities. Now we will go and mark on the cast those centric occlusion contacts that we felt were so important, and then transfer them back to this chart. And the reason we do this is because the method of occlusal adjustment that you are taught uses the 
central occlusion contacts to provide the final stability after the occlusal adjustment is completed. We try to avoid altering the centric occlusion stops if possible. There are some special cases where this is not followed to the letter, but generally we can avoid removing a centric occlusion stop from a case while doing the adjustment. So going back to the cast, we have to mark these centric occlusion contacts. Now we showed you with the shim stock that the all of the teeth had a contact, so now we have to mark these with the tape and then mark them on the cast. So holding these casts in centric occlusion, I give myself cheat a little bit by tightening this screw just enough so it makes contact. And then if I open and close, I'm actually opening and closing in centric occlusion. See, I can come forward and slide back, but right now I'm in centric occlusion. And just to check myself, I'll see if I can get tape to catch. See, I can get tape to catch by holding on this one. I shift it a little. I'll reset that. All right, now this is centric occlusion. So now we'll take our red ribbon and tap all the way around. Now you have to kind of do this carefully. You don't want to break this, the teeth, but also the articulator is rather free from side to side in centric occlusion because the articulator is only locked in the centric relation position. So to a certain extent, some of these marks will be extraneous and ha will have to be disregarded. So as best we can, we're trying to mark our centric occlusion stops. Now, from our functional occlusion in our freshman year, we're aware of the fact that generally our centric occlusion stops occur on cusp tips or very close to the cusp tips and generally down uh, in the fossas. So knowing that we do have a stop on most places, we here can look at the, we'll first look at the upper cast and uh, check in this area, these areas. Now let's start back over here with tooth number 15. Here we notice that there is a red mark down in the area of the fossa. So this, from our knowledge, we would consider this to be a centric occlusion stop. So we would make a small circle. Now generally that circle is much bigger than the actual centric occlusion stop. Now on the next tooth, we notice that we have a mark in this area of the fossa. Now again, these marks are made by the supporting cusp of the lower jaw. And here we have kind of a grayish area. It doesn't really show up that well. Here is much sharper. Here's a cuspid mark that's quite sharp. Here's one that's sharp, another sharp one, and then here's another quite sharp one. So that we've marked teeth 9 through 15. Now, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's go back to the chart that we had and transfer our marks. Now we should use a different color pencil. You notice in the book they use a different color ink to show the various stages of the adjustment. Now tooth number 15, we had a contact in this area. This was centric occlusion. In tooth number 14, we were a little bit in this area. 13, we didn't get one definitely yet. 12, we've got one in the mesial area. And then 11 has one here, so we would think that there's a, uh, the lower tooth that fits into this embrasure makes simultaneous contact on both of them. We have um, mesial and distal on 10, and we have distal on 9. So we have marked on the upper teeth where we have our centric occlusion stops. Now again, these are the areas that we would consider more or less untouchable, and we would try to avoid grinding in those areas. Now, tooth number 13, as I said, doesn't have a 
stop as indicated on this chart. So we should go back to the cast and check our centric occlusion to see if 13 actually does have a stop with our tape. So we'll take the tape, put it in, look for 13. Well, 13 doesn't actually have a, a stop. The other teeth did catch the paper, but when we isolate 13 by itself, it is a little bit open. So 13 itself does not have a centric occlusion stop. Now, actually, if this was on a patient and there wasn't so many reproductions of these various models with the small error that occurs with every reproduction, there should be a centric occlusion stop in this case. So now we'll go to the lower arch um, and see where our centric occlusion contacts were. So opposite of the contact on 15, we have supporting cusp mark here. For 14, we have supporting cusp mark here, here. Again, because I know that 13 doesn't actually contact, I would feel that the mark on um, 20 is extraneous. 21, we have a definite mark. And 22, we have a definite mark. Now, you notice that the pencil marks I put in are, are somewhat smaller than the actual mark because the tape does put on a little bit too much mark. Now, we'll go over here to the lateral. 23 has a contact. And I didn't see one on 24. Let me tap it again and see if I can... Yes, here we've got one on 24 right there. So the next step would be to transfer to the lower aspect of the chart our premature, or I'm sorry, our supporting cusp contact. We had one here. We had one here and here. And then we didn't put one there. We had one here. This one, this one, and that one. Now, going back to the lower again, we should see if we have any marks of the upper supporting cusp in the lower fossa. I'm going to have to mark that again. It didn't mark. Here I have a mark here, and I have a very slight mark right there. And you can just barely see it right there. Again, this one here, because we graphically showed that we don't have a contact, actually, the, the ribbon is actually about six or seven times thicker than that, so the ribbon shows that there's a contact here. Um, this first bicuspid, knowing the lingual cusp is so small, there's the fossa generally doesn't have a contact, and of course the lower incisor teeth in a normal relationship don't have lingual contact. Going back up to the upper teeth, checking the supporting cusp, we have a little contact here. We have one here. Again, this is probably the thickness of the ribbon on 13, and then 12 has one there. So we should go back to our chart again and transfer our contacts to the chart. Again, using the... Now, one may, if you get really fancy, use different colors for the fossa stops and different ones for the supporting cuts, but I think that just using centric occlusion stops as one particular color. Let me dot this one in because this is what the ribbon showed. There was none there, there was none there. Then up on 15, we were here, here, here. 
again, that one should be dotted in, I'm sorry. And then one here. Okay, so what we've done is on this one side, we've marked all of our centric occlusion stops. Now we should also go and mark the centric occlusion stops on the other side. So to save time, I'll cut right here, and when we come back, after a word from our sponsor, we will have this side colored in. Now I have completed the marking of the centric occlusion stops on the cast and on the chart. You'll notice that I've got some notes to myself on here. This tooth, although it's drawn, and generally most individuals probably have four cusps on the maxillary second molar, there are some individuals that have only three, and this individual has only three cusps, so I made a little note to myself because I put the supporting cusp contact right there, and that's generally where a lingual groove is, so I made a note that there were only three cusps. This void means that the, I misread the chart and I put the mark here, and it actually should have been this one. These arrows indicate that there is a centric occlusion stop present, and you'll notice the close proximity of that centric occlusion stop to our centric relation prematurity. Now, this is where the skillful operator uses his knowledge to avoid removing this, yet removing the prematurity. On the lower aspect, again, we notice that here, there is a centric occlusion stop right in the middle of this prematurity. Now this generally works out why we don't gr grind on these cusps to remove the prematurity, because there's no way that we could grind this and preserve that centric occlusion stop. So in this case, you see the choice of grinding from this point or that point up above here. We would have to select this point because we could grind in these areas without removing a stop. Yet down below here, we could not grind in this area at all without removing part of the stop. Here we have the lower bicuspid, you see the contact again is similar to the contact on 30. It'd be impossible to grind away very much of this prematurity without removing this stop. Again, you'll notice there are no contacts on the fossa area of the bicuspids on either side. We go back to the cast, we can see an illustration of why this occurs. If we go inside to the bicuspid area, you'll note that there actually is a, just the anatomic relation of these teeth, these fossas are completely open and there's no contact in the fossa region. Generally, if there is a contact, it's in the embrasure where this cusp makes contact on both embrasures. Now, if we bring this around to the front, we can illustrate the lateral and protrusive aspects of a mounting. If the case is moved from centric occlusion or centric relation into lateral excursion, now this would be right working because the mandibular segment is relatively moving to the right. So this is right working. Now this has a cuspid protected occlusion. There's no contact except this cuspid against the other cuspid. Now, in this position, on the working side, if we change the angle here on the working side and look in the area of the molars, so what I'm doing is I'm changing the working inclination You'll notice how little change occurs. You can barely see that moving up and down. However, if I go to the balancing side and do the same thing, you'll see there's quite a difference. And why is this? Well, this is because the feeling that the working condyle is the one that 
does not move the balancing condyle, does all the moving in the working condyle. It's just rotating, so there's very little effect. If we go to the opposite side, and we turn it around, and do the same thing. Again, on this side, there's a cuspid protected occlusion. This is left working. If we move the left side now, we notice very little change. If we move the right side, we notice quite a change. So in, in lateral excursion, only one condyle adjustment of the horizontal inclination has any effect. In protrusive, however, there is a effect that is different. If we move this case into its protrusive relationship and move either one, we'll notice there's quite a difference. So the horizontal collar inclination is effective on both sides in protrusive, but it's effective only on the balancing side in lateral excursion. When this is another aspect that we check on, on mountings is that the lateral excursion and the working excursion, or if a patient is a bruxer, the facet pattern in the lateral excursion should coincide. So if the patient had a large facet on the uh, buckle aspect of 28 against the uh, buckle cusp of the tooth opposite number five, we would expect that in lateral excursion on the mounting, those two facets should pass over each other. If they don't, that would mean that the condylar setting, the horizontal condylar setting of the mounting is incorrect because the patient has shown the ability to reach that area because the facet pattern is there. We'll now move into the grinding principles. We have marked the areas that we don't want to remove. We have marked the areas that are in premature contact, and we will now, with precise, accurate grindings, attempt to preserve the centric occlusion stops and eliminate the centric relation prematurities and the centric relation to centric occlusion slide. Now, what I do as a little safeguard to keep from going too far is setting the cast in centric occlusion I just let the pin make a contact and I hold it, set it that way. And this keeps me from going too far because if the pin starts to get in close proximity, I know that I'm starting to get very close to the vertical dimension of centric occlusion. What you're actually doing when you do an occlusal adjustment is that the discrepancy in vertical dimension between centric relation and centric occlusion is going to be eliminated by the removal of the prematurities. In centric relation, the vertical dimension, again measured at the pin, is going to be lowered or closed to the level of the centric occlusion vertical dimension. So what we will do is first we know that our prematurities are on tooth number five and tooth number three. So again, we'll take the tape, place it between the teeth, and tap the teeth together and execute the slide. Now you can see there's the prematurity, there's the slide. Now that's supposed to be eliminated. Okay, now looking. Again, I explained why we're going to, in these cases, grind in the upper fossas and on the upper inclines. And again, the reason is that the lower teeth, if we look at the chart, the lower teeth where the prematurities happen to be are right on the supporting cusps, and we can't remove those without losing a definite stop. However, on the upper teeth, we notice that the areas of premature contact 
are in areas where we can carefully remove material and yet preserve our stops. So now we will go to the upper bicuspid and looking at this, we have our red mark from here down to here. Now we have a stop in this area right here and here's the other aspect of that stop. We also have a stop up here. So we'll precisely and accurately avoid those but removing an amount of tooth structure Now, if we can come in a little closer on that, we can see that I've left this area. I've left this area, and I've taken off the area where the extraneous mark or the premature contact was. Now, this, again, may not be a complete removal. It's definitely better to go slowly and carefully rather than to remove everything all at once and possibly go beyond. Now, we'll move back to the molar where we had the premature contact. We have a longer area here. So we'll remove this precisely. Again, we're only removing the area of prematurity. Now, as we told you in lecture, and we will continue to tell you, what you're basically doing when you're doing an adjustment in centric relation is that you're making a more distal contact possible on the upper tooth for the lower supporting cusp because when you go into centric relation, take the mandible, put it in centric relation, all of the mandibular supporting cusps are thrust distally. So you have to remove interference if you're grinding in the upper in a way that will allow the mandibular supporting cusp to take up a more distal position when it's in centric relation. So this is what we're doing in the upper bicuspid, we ground toward the distal, and we also ground toward the distal in the upper molar. Now we'll go and close the articulator and see if this has diminished our slide at all. Well, I think you can see that the slide is less. It's not quite as stark, but some is still present. So we would go back and mark this. Again, duplicating the same thing and looking to see where our contacts are. Now, here we have, again, some more on the bicuspid. And being cautious, I didn't go all the way to this particular point, so I can go a little bit farther because, again, I'm removing more toward the distal. And this provides a safeguard. If I was using the instrument and going from the distal toward the mesial, I would have more of a tendency to go into the centric occlusion stop. Because as you know, the centric relation contacts in the upper are more distal than the centric occlusion contacts. So the mesial aspect of the centric occlusion mark is by far the most important. Now we'll see how this is. Okay, now I think that our contact relation has shifted to another tooth. Uh, another thing that I would like to point out on the chart is that the mechanical relationship of this premature contact here to the centric occlusion contact here illustrates the slide because the initial prematurity is made here, the mandible has to the supporting cusp down here has to go from this position, buccally, or since this is the right-hand side, toward the right. And if we go back to the articulator and look at the head-on shot of this, again, we remember that the upper member is moving toward the left, that is, 
can see this is moving toward the left. But the actual lower, which is the mandible, is going right. So now we'll take our shim stock and look again to check where is our centric relation prematurity. Has it shifted or is it still in the same place? We have no contact there, none there, none there, none there. We may be on the other side. Yes, we are on the other side now. That was just the, there's a contact there. So instead of this side being void of contacts, now we've shifted our contact. Again, on this side we check, and we're very, we're free all the way through. So we'll come over here and Check out and notice if we can find out where this new prematurity is. Mark it again. Now, this prematurity is now in this area of the cuspid, in this lingual surface of the cuspid now, we have a premature contact in here. So what we would do is we would remove that area of prematurity and we would gradually work all the prematurity is going step by step until we completely adjusted the case in centric relation. Now, when we had this chart, we made our prematurity. When we change this, when we grind and we eliminate this, we also have to put the new ones on. So if the these were the initial ones and we grind grinded ground those off, then we move to this other position, we would then put this in. Now, in order so that this can be kept in order because we don't put all kinds of marks that eventually obliterate the drawing, we have this other chart that has tooth number, location of grinding, and then times ground. So what one would write would be since we ground on tooth number five, we would put that, and then we ground on tooth number three. And then on tooth number five, oh, we'd probably be better off to put it this way. On tooth number five, we ground on the mesial buccal incline of the lower, I mean of the lingual cusp. You can make yourself an abbreviation. And on number three, we ground on the buccal incline of the mesiolingual cusp. And then if we had to grind it again, we would put a check. We, if we had to grind it again, we'd put another check. And that's how we would keep it in order, so that when this chart is finished, we have a step-by-step -step numbering of the teeth when they're ground. And also, this other chart will fill in where the prematurities shifted from side to side. So we will not be able to tell on this chart exactly which were the first prematurities when this chart is completed, but we will be able to tell because we have written it down 
in another location. Now I have completed the adjustment and centric relation on this case and additional marks have been drawn where I was required to do some grinding. Now when we closed I mentioned that we had a contact over here on number 11. Now this was and almost never does this happen in, in, in a patient's mouth that this cuspid lingual surface would become an interference because of the fact that when you push the mandible into centric relation generally it goes it always goes distally and the lower front teeth buccal surface move away from the lingual surface of the upper front teeth so this one was probably as a result of an error I did correct it slightly but again this is generally not seen in the mouth these other areas that came into interference were ground away. The lower, there was no grinding done on the lower arch at all. Now, this does not mean that we never grind on the lower. What it illustrates is that when these contacts of the lower teeth were such that they were occurring only in cuspal areas, and generally it was the buccal or supporting cusp of the lower teeth, the area of choice was the fossa or incline area of the upper teeth. Now these areas, again, the distal seat or a area for the lower supporting cusp to fit more distally into the upper fossa was our principal rule. And if this was the area that was ground, it was ground toward the distal to make room for a supporting cusp on the lower. The other chart shows the notation of these various areas such as uh, number 15 I made a note that we ground in the distal fossa number 5 we ground on the distal buccal incline of the lingual cusp and number 3 we ground on the distal buccal incline of the distal lingual cusp now if I go to the uh, articulator and we can take a closer look at the occlusal surfaces of the upper teeth the first thing that one should notice is that the teeth are not mutilated. These teeth are not ground off flat. They're not uh, completely gouged out with a with a knife. We have areas such as, as we told you about 15, the distal fossa. This was ground out here. We have areas we said number um, 12. We have the mesial buccal incline of the lingual cusp. That's over here. We had an area ground here. Again, that's the stop area down there, but this is the area that we ground. Come over to this side. This is the area that we did first. We ground. Again, it's a area that's well defined and not, um, you know, this cusp is not weakened or gouged out so that the possibility of fracture is brought in. The number three here, we have an area that was ground in this way. Number two, we have an area listed that we ground on the buccal incline of the lingual cusp. That would be in this area. We ground so that the occlusal surface of these teeth is not mutilated by any means. And, and uh, although one can tell that these teeth have been ground because there will be uh, small dished out areas visible, the teeth have not been destroyed as sometimes a concept is achieved by a student. The closing of the articulator demonstrates that there is no slide. Now this is in centric relation. That's the contact. If I put exert any downward pressure, there is no movement. There is a solid contact. This is much more solid and we played back a tape of the beginning when we were initially tapping, you would notice the, the difference. The hollow sound is demonstrates the uniform contact of all of the teeth. 
Now, what is present, however, is a freedom in centric. This articulator can be moved back and forth on the same plane because we have removed the interferences. The areas where the cusp were in contact and prematurities have been removed so that the patient can go to centric relation, but the patient also can go back to their old centric occlusion position. And this is demonstrated by the freedom and centric. You notice this freedom and centric is not very large. And um, this goes with the geometry of as you close the slide, generally most of the slide is a vertical component and it isn't very much of a horizontal component. As you eliminate the vertical component, the horizontal component is correspondingly shortened. And here we have just this a little bit less than a millimeter that we can move these teeth back and forth to illustrate our freedom and centric. The next step after the adjustment of centric relation would be the adjustment of the lateral excursions in working and balancing. The first thing one would determine is are there interferences in lateral excursion? We talk about interferences and we talk about prematurities. Prematurities prohibit the maintenance of a stable occlusal relationship. So in centric relation with a prematurity, it is unstable, therefore the slide occurs. Now the centric relation contacts that are here are all stable, they're uniform. If we went and checked with um, something between the teeth, remember we didn't have a uniform contact, we can see that the ribbon catches it's again a centric relation. The ribbon catches in all areas. Now also if we're back in the centric occlusion position, that is we put it together and slide it back in the area of freedom and centric, we can also still catch. Now we should also probably demonstrate that we can catch with the extremely thin paper as well. The shimstock again catches. So we have preserved our centric occlusion contacts, yet eliminated our centric relation interferences. Or, I'm sorry, prematurities. Now, an interference is something that inhibits the lateral excursions. So you can have protrusive interferences that inhibit protrusion, and you have your working and balancing interferences. Now, if we check this, we go from in this excursion, which is right working, we see that there is not a jerky movement. It is a smooth gliding movement. Now we check working out to a cusp, end-to-end -end relationship in the cuspid area. There is no contact of any other posterior tooth in working on this side other than you can see that facet that I'm grinding or that area of wear. If we turn this around and again got in close and we showed the area, there is no contact on this side either. So if we demonstrate now the working relationship on the other side, we have a cuspid protected occlusion again. The only working contact that we notice is on the cuspid. And if we check the balancing, uh, let's check it in through here. The balancing in here, again, there's no contact. You can see the airspace as we slide. The only tooth you can see in contact is that cuspid tapping over there. All the other teeth are, are free from contact. So this particular case does not have any working or balancing interferences, so this case, the adjustment would be completed. The adjustment on a stone cast can never be as accurate using the methods that we have sh showed you in this demonstration as is the movements produced by the patient in their own mouth. 
so that one would not be able to take that grinding sheet and expect to go step by step through that grinding sheet and complete an occlusal adjustment exactly the same way as one did on the cast. The cast served to show us where we will be general areas where we will have to grind, the extent of the grinding required, and also are very educational to become familiar with the methods that we want to use when grinding in the mouth. So in the mouth one might expect some variance between the grinding chart and the grinding that is actually required in the mouth. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.